found in your pew Bible on page 640. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exalt in my God. For he has clothed, clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered, covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth springs, brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. The second reading is from Luke chapter 2, verses 22 through 40, to be found on page 889 of the Bible. And when the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And inspired by the Spirit, he came into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us, thou servant, depart in peace according to thy word. For my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles, and for the glory to thy people Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him, and Simeon blessed them, and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is spoken against. And a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that thoughts out of many hearts may be revealed. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years from her virginity, and as a widow until she was eighty-four. She could not depart from the temple, worshiping with fasting and prayer night and day. And coming up at that very hour, she gave thanks to God and spoke of him to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. And when they were, had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own city, Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. This is the word of the Lord. Please join me in one verse of Jesus loves me. Do I do need a rest? 
Would you want to sit on my egg in my nest? The elephant laughed. Why, of all silly things, I haven't feathers. I haven't wings. Me on your egg? Why doesn't that make sense? Your egg is so small, ma'am, and I'm so immense. Tut, tut, answered Maisie. I know you're not small, but I'm sure you can do it. No trouble at all. Just sit on it softly. You're gentle and kind. Come be a good fellow. I know you won't mind. I can't, said the elephant. Please, begged the bird. I won't be gone long, sir. I give you my word. I'll hurry right back. Why, I'll never be missed. Very well, said the elephant, since you insist. You want a vacation, go fly off and take it. I'll sit on your egg and I'll try not to break it. I'll stay and be faithful. I mean what I say. Toodle-doo, sang out Maisie, and she fluttered away. Hmm, the first thing to do, murmured Horton, let's see. The first thing to do is to pop prop up this tree and make it much stronger than has to be done. Before I get on it, I must weigh a ton. Then carefully, tenderly, gently he crept up the trunk to the nest where the little eggs slept. Then Horton the elephant smiled. Now that's that. And he sat, and he sat, and he sat, and he sat. And then, and he sat all that day, and he kept the egg warm. And he sat all that night through a terrible storm. And it poured, and it lightened, it thundered, it rumbled. It, this isn't much fun, the poor elephant grumbled. I wish you'd come back, because I'm cold and I'm wet. I hope that Maisie, the bird, doesn't forget. But Maisie, by this time, was far beyond reach, enjoying the sunshine way off on Palm Beach. <coughs> having, and having such fun, such a wonderful rest, she decided she'd never go back to the nest. So Horton kept sitting there day after day, and soon it was autumn, and the leaves blew away. And then came the winter, the snow and the sleet, and icicles hung from his trunk and his feet. But Horton kept sitting and said with a sneeze, I'll stay on this egg and I won't let it freeze. I meant what I said, and I said what I meant. An elephant is faithful, 100%. Do you guys know anybody that's faithful 100% of the time? Do you? Oh, sure you do. Jesus and God are faithful 100% of the time. Are we faithful 100% of the time? Probably not. But there was a man in the Bible who was faithful to God, and God was faithful to him, and his name was Simeon. And Simeon stayed in the temple, and God promised him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah, or Jesus. And Mary and Joseph took him to the temple to give to give him to God, to dedicate him to God, and Simeon was there and saw him. So God keeps his promises to us always, just like he did Simeon. And we need to strive to keep our promises to God. Because next Thursday is what? Do you guys know what next Thursday is? New Year's Day, right? What do we all do around New Year's? Do we make new promises, new resolutions? things we're going to do this year that I'm really bad at keeping. <laughs> and then sometimes do those involve God? And uh, am I even bad at keeping those? Yeah, oh yeah. So we all need to try to be like God and be faithful and important and do and say, I meant what I said and I said what I meant that I'm going to be faithful. 100%. Okay? Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for being faithful, thank you for being faithful. to us.
us 100%. Help us to strive to be faithful in all things that we do 100%. In Jesus' name. Susical the Musical. Are you familiar with that? Many of you, if you've seen Susical the Musical, Horton is the, is the main character of that particular musical. Uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting musical, let's, let's put it that way. Um, it uses a lot of Dr. Seuss characters uh, throughout that particular musical. I've seen it several times because uh, at Fulton High School, put it on as a high school production, and all two of my kids were in high school, and my youngest daughter was in eighth grade. She also was in it. All three of my kids were in it. So I got to see it, of course, probably about 17 times at that point. Uh, and I've, I've seen it since then, and it is, a, it is an interesting story, particularly the storyline of Horton, uh, and how silly it is that this, this elephant is the one that's caring for this egg for such a long time. And he stays on that nest, and he stays in that tree. And they even move the tree and take it into a circus, and he goes everywhere. And, and but he is faithful uh, forever. And we're going to be considering a couple of people who are faithful um, on this day from the scripture that we heard read this morning, when Mary goes to the temple and presents the Messiah for the very first time, her son, her infant baby. And we listen and we hear the story of Simeon and Anna as people of great faith. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, our rock and our redeemer. Do you see that old man sitting over there in the corner? He's easy to miss. He shuffles into the temple almost every day. Look, he's shrunken. He's bent with age. He wanders around awkwardly among all the crowds until weariness overcomes him and he finally just sits down in that corner over there. I think he would melt right into the shadows. If it weren't for that startling white beard, that bald head, and that, that gleam that you can see in his cloudy eyes. And did you see her? Did you see her over in the shadows by the entrance over there? That old woman with wrinkled skin clinging tightly to her bones, nearly emaciated from all those years of fasting. Her countenance is tilted slightly upward from all those years and endless hours of praying to God. Her eyes are always scanning there by the door, peering at all the faces as the people come in, all the faces that stream by every day. And she is there every day. Maybe, maybe a couple of the priests in the temple know her name. You know, we often hear this story of Simeon and of Anna around, or just on the heels of, usually, Advent, the Advent season, the season of waiting. You know, when our minds are in the waiting mode as we're preparing for Christmas, just as we did for those past four weeks leading up to Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, we were in Advent. We were waiting with great expectation for Christmas morning. Just as Simeon and Anna are waiting for what? What are they waiting for? They've been told that they will not die until they see the Messiah. They're expecting, they're waiting for the Messiah. This story, it reflects the ethos of Advent. And we so often take for granted the waiting of this old man and this old woman at the temple. In this brief little story, 
that we find right after the birth narrative of Jesus Christ. You know, we're, we're, we're used to hearing this waiting. Mary is waiting, obviously. She's waiting expectantly. We're waiting during the season of Advent. So Simeon and Anna waiting. Yeah, that seems, that seems somehow right at this Christmas season. But I think the quality of the waiting of Simeon and Anna is somehow different than perhaps what we experience at Advent. <clears throat> You see, our waiting during Advent, and even Mary's waiting as she was pregnant with the Christ child, preparing to give birth, you know, it has some kind of structure to it. Mary, being pregnant, she knew roughly when the birth is going to occur. Uh, the swelling of her body, the new pains and discomforts that she goes to, the phases of the moon as the months pass by, they all mark the time of your waiting for one with one who is pregnant, waiting for that child to arrive. And it was no different with Mary. And ourselves, during our Advent waiting these last four or five weeks, we had an Advent wreath up here that has now magically disappeared and been replaced here by our, our, our lectern. At, but each, each week of Advent, we lit a new candle until finally that center candle, that Christ candle, was lit on Christmas Eve. And it, it was Christmas. It was Christmas. We sang Silent Night, we lit our candles, and we left on Christmas Eve. And then it became Christmas. You know, we some of you might have, uh, have written, you know, special things on your calendar to mark things off. My, my family we used to have an Advent calendar when our kids were growing up every Advent season, and we'd have a little uh, thing that we would move along in the pocket of the calendar every day of Advent. Uh, and, or some of you, you know, you have calendars where you check off those little squares, and in those seasons of waiting, you know, those days progress, and we can see that on the calendar, until finally, the days arrive, and it's Christmas. But I think the waiting that was taking place in the lives of Anna and Simeon was quite different. They didn't have any candles to light to mark the passing of each week as they got nearer and nearer to when they would see the Messiah. They didn't have an Advent calendar that they were moving something along or checking off the days so they could see that, oh, it's almost here or just a few days away. No. <coughs> Their waiting is fueled only by the Holy Spirit. By the Spirit's promise to them that they will see the Messiah. But when? Where? How will they even know? When we encounter them in this story, they are old. They are described as being very old and withered. They have been waiting for how long? We, we don't know. When did the Spirit first speak to them and tell them that they were going to see the Messiah? We don't know, but we know there had to have been years and years and perhaps years and years and more years of waiting in their lives. Waiting expectantly. And you know, it seems to me that this kind of, of open-ended waiting, not knowing, not seeing the end date, not knowing when something is going to happen, that could eat away at a person's life. That could be very difficult. You know, this kind of waiting where all the hopes, all your decisions, everything you're doing in your life is focusing on some future event. But you don't know when it's going to happen. You just don't know when. You know, countless books and stories and even movies today urge us to seize the day. Carpe diem. You know, we, we hear it. And Anna and Simeon had to hear the same kind of thing even in their time, over 2,000 years ago. The first readers of Luke's Gospel had heard it because in Proverbs it says, Do not boast about tomorrow, for you do not know what a day may bring. And then James echoes, Now listen, you who say, Today or tomorrow will go this or to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. And even Jesus says later on in his ministry, 
Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. And there sit Simeon and Anna in the temple, looking to, longing for tomorrow, for the future, for what may happen, that they've been promised is going to happen in their lifetimes. But when? Aren't their lives coming to an end? We hear something like 84 years for Anna. Does that mean she's 84 years old? Or that it's been 84 years since she was married? It's not clear in the scripture. But she's old. And Simeon is old. They've been waiting expectantly all of their lives. And what really is the point of their waiting? Because you know the Messiah will come or not. The people will be saved by God or not. You know, surely God's plan of redemption is not dependent upon these two old people and their long, long years of waiting. I'm pretty sure that God's, God's redeeming work in the world did not depend on Simeon and Anna, and they're waiting. Jesus would have come, would have eventually been recognized, would have carried out his ministry without this brief scene in the temple when Mary presented Jesus at the temple. You know, this was a scene that, that when I imagine, mostly unobserved. You know, if Mary and Joseph realized it and they heard this man say some things about their son and then they saw this old prophetess say some things about her son, but, you know, I bet this scene was likely disregarded by most people that did see it or hear it. Yeah, that's crazy old people. Just go on. All these things that are going on in the temple. I'm fairly sure that God's work of redeeming the world is never dependent upon one single individual or even two individuals like Simeon and Anna. That's not to say that individuals are not important. One person, a couple of people, a small group of people can make a big difference in carrying out God's work of justice and mercy in the world. But, but what I want to say is that the redemption of the world is God's work. It wasn't just Simeon's work or Anna's work or your work or just my work. It's God's work in the world. So, so why the waiting? Why the waiting? Why would the Holy Spirit ask of these two that they sacrifice their lives to this nebulous time of waiting? Do not worry about tomorrow, they hear, but their lives have revolved around tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, then the next day, or the next day, or next year, or the next. Why the waiting? Not for the redemption of the world. That's going to happen without them. But maybe, just maybe, the waiting is an important part of the redemption of Simeon. And the redemption of Anna. And then also for the redemption of all of those who receive the eager gazes of Simeon and Anna in the temple courts. You know, I can just imagine throughout the years at first that Simeon and Anna are there in the temple as they're waiting, as they're watching. It's the priests who first catch their eye. You know, surely the, the, these, these men of God, surely among them, that's where the Messiah will come. And each priest, as they move and they work in the temple, is watched closely and is considered by both Simeon and Anna. And surely they can see within the lives of these men the spark of God right there in their lives. And they see it and they observe it. And yet, no, not the Messiah among the priests. 
So Simeon and Anna eventually have to turn their gaze toward other non-priestly men, but strong young men. You know, if not a priest, then the Messiah surely would come with an, with an entourage walking <laughs> proudly into the temple, bringing a rich <laughs> sacrifice. And each handsome young face is looked upon by Simeon and Anna with great expectation. The rich brown eyes of these men are explored as, as some spark of the Holy One, yes, is found in their eyes. There, there's a spark of God right within them. And yet, no, not, not the Messiah. Not to be found there. Well, then maybe... Maybe it's a man not quite so strong or not quite so young, not quite so powerful. Maybe it's, maybe it's going to be someone unassuming. The Savior of the people need not stand out in the crowd. So Simeon and Anna start observing all of those common people that come in. And they know their eyes. They know their faces. They look for that spark. They look for that essence of God within them. And they see it over and over again. And yet, no, not the Messiah among them. Well, could it could it possibly could it possibly be one of the poor? One of those who are wearing rags that come outside the doors of the temple and beg for money and for food that have nothing of their own to offer, but they're simply there begging. They're dirty. They're the, they're the rabble. And so Simeon and Anna start to examine them. And they look in their faces and they look in their eyes and they see there the spark of God. But no, not, not the Messiah. Not there. But wait a minute. Surely, surely, surely the Messiah couldn't come as a woman. Would Simeon and Anna actually look at women as well? They started to look at their eyes as they came into the temple. They started to stare and they started to look for that spark. And in the women that came through the temple and passed through, yeah, they saw it. The spark of God in their faces, in their eyes. But, no, not the Messiah. Not yet. The long, long way leads Anna and Simeon to consider them all, to look at them all, to examine them, to look into their souls, to look for that spark of God, to look into the faces of the poor and the powerless, as well as the wealthy and the powerful, to look with expectation at all of them, even those who were never looked on with anything but disdain. Until this time. And in their long waiting, Simeon learned. And Anna learned. That yes, he could be the one. Or she could be the one. Or he could be the one. Or they might be. Because there is a spark. There in their lives. And in so many, many faces, in so many, many eyes, they did not find the Messiah, but they surely found God. Do you see her today? This old, old woman who is bent and decrepit, wrinkled and emaciated from fasting in her life. Do you see her today? She's flailing her arms around. She's exclaiming about this baby that Mary has brought to the temple. She's excited. Perhaps she's finally gone over the edge. Perhaps senility has finally come to her, but no, she's She's exclaiming about God's redemption of God's people as she sees this baby. Do you see the joy in her face? Do you see the sparkle in her eye? And then look, do you see him? 
Do you see that old man that has been here forever? Do you see his, his gnarled and weathered hands go over and take that baby out of its mother's arms and see him hold that baby and caress the cheek of that baby with his weathered hands? Do you see the smile on his face? Do you notice... Do you notice his long white beard caressing that baby's tummy as he nods his head? Do you see that spark in Simeon's eye? Because God was there in Simeon and in Anna as well as in that human baby. Do you see God? Do you see God in that face? Do you see God in, in that smile? Do you see God? Do you feel God in the twinkle of those eyes? Do you know God in that touch? Because God God is here. Our waiting is over. The one we have waited for, the one we have longed for, the very presence of God is here. Is here. The presence of God is with us. It's in that sparkle. It's in that twinkle. It's in that smile. It's in that touch that you see now all around this room. Our waiting is over. God's presence is here among us now. Thanks be to God. Amen. Shall we pray? Gracious and all God, we know, we see, we feel your presence among us. It's here in each and, and every one of us this day. And we know that when we leave this place, you dismiss your servants in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation just as the eyes of Simeon and Anna saw your salvation so long ago. The salvation which you have prepared in the presence of all people a light for revelation to all the world and for glory to all of us, your people. Thank you, Almighty God. Amen. Let us now respond to God's word this morning by rising either in body or in spirit and singing our next hymn, number 258. Which is something if I can find it in my old Don't <laughs> uh, tell it on the mountain. Shall we rise and sing? <laughs>
then please join me as together we affirm our faith by repeating the Nicene Creed that you find in your bulletin this morning. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth. Of all that is seen and unseen, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge both the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. On this blessed morning, we know that God is with us. God's presence is here with us, just as God's presence is with us at all times. God truly blesses us in so many ways out of a feeling of, of gratitude for those blessings, we now ask that you be generous in your tithes and in your offerings.
so that when we look upon the faces of others and we see the face of need, we know that you are there. And we know that they can be cared for. Continue to be with us now. For it is in your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we prepare now for our time of prayer, let us pause for a moment of silence as we consider the blessings during this special season. Shall we pray? Glorious and gracious God, the God who we glimpse in the joy and the smiles and the faces of others. Our God, your blessing, your bounty have been poured out to us that we may now be your people in service to others throughout this world. Today we have gathered here to praise you and to thank you for the wonderful ways that you have blessed our lives. And we know those blessings are great. Thank you, Almighty oh God. But we also know that there are so many who continue to be in need throughout this world. Those that we have mentioned here this morning who are in need, who are in need of your comfort, who are in need of your peace, who are in need of your blessing at this time. Be with them now. And for all of those in this community, in this state, in this country, and around this world who suffer, who feel oppression, who feel lost because they have lost loved ones, who feel pain because of wounds inflicted upon them, who suffer from illness and sickness, we ask that your peace descend upon them, that they may make it through this day, that they may know that they too are a loved child of God. Care for their needs and continue to comfort them with your steadfast love. Just as you continue to be with us now, as we repeat the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Let us now rise one last time here.
place this day knowing that Christ goes with you. That little baby that Mary presented at the temple that morning has come among us. And that means that God is here. And regardless of where you are this week, regardless of where you go, where you might travel, know that God is right there. God is right above you. God is below you. God is always behind you and always before you. God stands right beside you. And most importantly of all, God is right inside you as well. Look for God's presence this week in all that you have